I'm Yolanda and this is Speak On. As part of our series on love, sex and relationships, we're discussing BDSM. Bondage, discipline, domination, submission, sadism and masochism. When we hear BDSM, we think Rihanna singing about whips and chains. We think of that terribly written series of novels which featured BDSM and then was made into equally terrible (laughs) films. Couldn't even say that without laughing, they're horrible. Um, (laughs) We think of Army Hammer being kink-shamed while his leaked messages trend on Twitter. But what does BDSM mean? What kind of people do it? Should we all be trying it? Today, I'm joined by Dr Brad Sagarin, a professor of psychology at Northern Illinois University and the head of the science BDSM research team. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, you have an amazing job. Um, but let's go, before we go into that, can you tell us, like, what does BDSM stand for? What do all those letters mean? So uh, you got the acronym right. Uh, BDSM is a compound acronym, bondage and discipline, dominance, submission, sadism and masochism. And it's a umbrella term that refers to a range of often sexual activities that people do that involve bondage, uh, the administration of physical or psychological pain, uh, dominance and submission, uh, and so on. There's a, a definition that Jay Wiseman wrote for his book, SM 101, that I really like, where he says that um, SM is the knowing use of psychological dominance and submission and or physical bondage and or pain and or related practices in a safe, legal, consensual manner in order for the participants to experience erotic arousal and or personal growth. Um, Definitely tries to capture (laughs) a lot in there. But one of the things that I really like about it is that it recognizes that BDSM is certainly for a lot of people very erotic, very sexual, uh, but not for everybody and not every time. There are some people who practice BDSM primarily as a spiritual practice or some people Mm -hmm. find it very therapeutic to do BDSM. So it's a really wide range of activities and people get a variety of different things out of it. Wow. Um, So with the different letters, so we've got bondage, uh, discipline, domination, submission, sadism and masochism. So actually let's start with going through what those are. What is bondage? Sure. So bondage is typically the use of physical restraints. So the use of rope, uh, the use of uh, handcuffs, uh, uh, other types of cuffs, things like that to physically restrict somebody. Uh, And for some people, bondage is a central interest in what they do with with BDSM. Either they, some people find it very sexually arousing and exciting to be bound. Other people find it very arousing to tie somebody else up. Um, And other people have reported finding it very uh, meditative that when they're put into bondage of some sort, Uh, it puts them into very much a sort of here and now meditative state. And so uh, they find it to be a very enjoyable centering uh, experience that can lead to uh, altered states of consciousness. Oh, wow. And and then what about the discipline and domination submission part of that? So uh, the discipline and domination and submission is typically thought of as fairly psychological. So domination and submission, either in the context of one scene, uh, kind of a, a, a period of time where people are doing a range of BDSM activities, or as a part of a long-term relationship, one person may be more dominant in that relationship, another person may be more submissive, and that's really a psychological, relational uh, aspect of the interaction that they're doing. Brilliant. And then, so the sadism and masochism, because this is the bit that I'm really not sure on, what are they? Sure. So sadism is enjoyment for from administering pain to another person. It can be physical pain, psychological pain. And masochism is the enjoyment of somebody receiving pain, again, physical pain or psychological pain. For ethical BDSM practitioners, somebody who self-identifies as a sadist wants to Uh, put somebody else into pain, but only a consenting partner who themselves is getting some enjoyment and gratification out of the experience. And likewise, masochists want to get into an interaction with somebody that they trust uh, and can can read them well during a scene. Uh, But also, you know, definitely should point out that masochists don't enjoy just any kind of pain. Uh, Masochists don't enjoy stubbing their toe, typically. Uh, It's going to be a certain kind of pain in a certain context that can then make that pain uh, pleasurable and enjoyable. Okay. So when I actually told people that I was going to have this conversation and when I was drawing up the list of topics that we were going to be covering, a few people did kind of, they pulled a face 
And then someone said, oh, that'd be interesting because the kind of people that are, are like attracted to doing that, you know, there's obviously there's something wrong or they've got something ha- that's happened in their childhood that's attracted them to it. And I was like, well, well no, because it's such a broad, a broad stretch of, a spectrum of activity and people can like what they like. But can you tell me a little bit more what, about what kind of people are into BDSM and why they're into it as well? Well, it's a great question. And the most recent evidence says that there are a lot of people out there who are into BDSM. If we think about BDSM not in the sometimes kind of scary term BDSM uh, and defining it as like, do you self-identify as a BDSM practitioner? Because those numbers tend to be relatively low because that's really asking about self-identity. If you think about the activities, if you ask people, for example, do you enjoy... uh, Uh, dominating your partner during sex or being tied up for sexual pleasure. The numbers get quite a bit higher. The the latest uh, data that I've seen actually have it that if you ask people about behaviors, that over two thirds of individuals have said that they have either done an activity that we would classify as BDSM or fantasize about that kind of activity. And so if over two thirds of individuals are doing it, I think we'd be kind of hard pressed to say that it is universally a pathology that is leading to that sort of desire. There's also been some research that has looked specifically at the kind of psychological profile of BDSM practitioners. And the basic thing that you find is that actually BDSM practitioners look a lot like everybody else. Um, There are certainly people in the BDSM community um, that have experienced, uh, unfortunately, abuse as a child. Um, And some people anecdotally link what they experienced as a child to their perception of why they're into BDSM today. But it is certainly far from universal. Um, And there are a lot of people that are BDSM that do not... uh, have that as part of their background. Um, There are other people who do, but don't necessarily link that to BDSM. And that the numbers don't seem to be any higher in the BDSM community than in the larger community. And likewise, if you look at a variety of personality traits, you see, for example, that BDSM practitioners are somewhat higher in openness to experience, um, a psychological trait that, you know, probably shouldn't surprise us that BDSM folks are are higher in that. Um, But that really... On the whole, BDSM practitioners look a lot like the rest of the world in terms of a variety of um, psychological profiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I think that's that's definitely something that people are going to be interested in because they had so many questions about that. But I, you know, when I spoke to them, I was like, again, it's that broad spectrum. And I think they will be surprised when they hear this to realize that actually they like those activities too. And I know some of them do. I know these people. They've told me. (laughs) Um, Well, it's pretty common. You know, I mean, arguably, statistically, if you've got two thirds of people who either have tried out BDSM or fantasize about it, statistically, we'd have to consider that normal. One word you've said a lot is about the consent part of it. So how does like BDSM and consent work? Because a lot of people know of, of the kind of the term safe words, but they don't really know what it is they're referring to. Sure. Consent is central to the practice of BDSM. In research that has asked BDSM practitioners to describe what's really the foundation at the heart of BDSM, consent is typically the most common thing that that is mentioned. And the BDSM community has a long-standing practice of what is currently kind of referred to as affirmative consent. The idea that if two people or more people are going to engage in sex or some sort of activity, that all of them need to actively say, yes, I want to be doing this thing. And this is different than sort of the old practice of no means no. And certainly if somebody says no, sex or whatever the activity is should stop. But affirmative consent says that that's not enough. That what we need is everybody who's involved enthusiastically saying, yes, I want to be here. I want to be doing this. And the BDSM community has been doing this for decades. Uh, Mm -hmm. There is the idea of safe, sane, and consensual, um, which has consensuality as a central tenant to healthy BDSM. Or uh, risk-aware consensual kink uh, is another Uh, acronym that is sometimes used, RAC, uh, as a way of doing healthy BDSM. And so 
the idea that people who are going to do BDSM should engage in an active process, for example, of sitting down and talking about what each of them wants, what their limits are, uh, what turns them on, what they'd like to have as part of the scene, and then they respect those limits that they said when the scene is going on. You mentioned the idea of a safe word, and that's a really important concept that many people who do BDSM practice. And the idea of a safe word is it's a code word that the people who are doing a BDSM scene together decide on beforehand indicates that either the activities need to slow down, that people need to do a check-in, that things need to change, or that things need to stop immediately. One of the most common sets of safe words uh, comes from traffic lights is red, yellow, green. Mm -hmm. uh, green means things are going great. Yellow means, okay, we need to have some caution. We need to talk about it, uh, maybe, maybe change around what's going on. And red is essentially an indication of an immediate withdrawal of consent, that the scene needs to stop immediately. Mm -hmm. And that safe word can be said by either the bottom in the scene, the person who is being tied up, is, is getting flogged or whipped, um, is sort of receiving the stimulation, or it can be said by the top because sometimes the top finds themselves in a scene where they need to, to get out of that scene for one reason or another yeah and you said the word seen a lot there so what does that mean sure uh, uh thanks yeah. great question a scene in bdsm is a defined period of time within which BDF, BDSM activities take place. Mm -hmm. uh, scenes will sometimes begin very formally with one person kneeling and the other person putting a collar on them. It can sometimes start very informally to people who are in an ongoing, for example, romantic relationship that BDSM is a part of. Um, it might start with some flirtation and, and, and looks at each other, and then a scene just kind of like naturally flows out of that. Um, a scene will typically then have a, one or more of variety of BDSM activities that take place and then at some point the scene ends. Again, it can either have a sort of formal end or it can, you know, kind of uh, have a have a bit of a fade out depending on what the people are interested in. Scenes can last anywhere from five minutes to multiple hours to some people might think about a scene that might last multiple days if they stay in that dynamic that is taking place. Mm -hmm. After a scene is over, Many BDSM practitioners engage in a process of what's called aftercare, where the two people or more people who are in a scene sit together and cuddle. Maybe they have a drink of water or a snack. They debrief about what was going on. And it's a way for the, for the individuals to, to reconnect with each other, um, mm -hmm. to talk about what they liked, what went well, what might not have gone so well, and to kind of get themselves back into a normal headspace um, before they re-engage in, in kind of the rest of, of their lives. BDSM activities can be very intense. They can produce altered states of consciousness in tops and bottoms in scenes. And so as a result, the, the aftercare that often happens is a really good way to help people transition back into a, you know, more typical state of mind. Wow. So it sounds like there's kind of a lot of work, prep, research I guess as well and so much communication so there has to be like a really good level of trust with the people involved can it ever be spontaneous then or is it always got to be this like this much prep and conversation beforehand um, that's a great question, and that can really vary. Part of it varies based on the people that are involved. Um, for two people who are doing their very first scene together, they probably want to sit down and have a pretty explicit discussion about activities that they like and dislike, limits, uh, skills, and that sort of thing. Um, and it doesn't have to happen that way, but that can often leave the individuals more ready to know when they enter the scene what they're going to do, what they're anticipating, and so on. Um, for people who have played together before or for people who uh, meet each other and it sort of clicks and they decide to jump in without that level of explicit discussion, consent is still a really critical element of it, but there may be less of a formal sit down and negotiate exactly what's going to take place. Um, and actually, there's some, some very recent research that uh, Hannah Tarleton, one of the members of the Science of BDSM research team, uh, did where she looked at uh, consent and the way the nuance of negotiation and what she found, uh, not surprisingly, is that when people are doing a new scene, uh, what's sometimes called pickup play, if two people meet at a party and decide they're going to do a scene, that typically it's seen that it's much more important for them to do explicit negotiation, to not rely so much on nonverbals, uh, to negotiate safe words and that sort of thing. But when people are doing a scene in the context of an ongoing romantic relationship, there's greater flexibility in the way that that negotiation takes place. 
Consent mm -hmm. is still really critical, um, but there's a more sophisticated perception of the way that that consent can be uh, discussed. Yeah, and you said romantic relationship there, and it's the, the description of it feels so far away from what any, like what I say, what I would deem as romantic, which would have that spontaneity and everything, all that kind of, it feels very clinical. So how easy is it to kind of have that, I suppose, like a BDSM kind of structure in a romantic relationship? Is it something that people find quite easy to maintain and, I don't know, continue to do? Uh, it's a great question. Some people in the context of a romantic relationship find that BDSM is one of the things that keeps the passion going mm -hmm. uh, because BDSM can create excitement and novelty with new activities uh, and so on in a way that in a long-term relationship, otherwise passion may have a tendency to you know, sort of diminish over the course of a relationship. And so I, I think that for people for whom BDSM is something that they want to do and are interested in, I think that uh, BDSM within the context of a romantic relationship can bring a lot to that relationship. Um, BDSM, of course, doesn't always take place in the context of a romantic relationship. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. Sometimes people are play partners, so they may be friends and do BDSM scenes together. Um, that can sometimes, in I think a really fascinating way, cross uh, typical sexual orientation, so that there may be um, two heterosexual men who like to do scenes with each other. And I think that that's one of the great examples of the way that BDSM can be erotic, but not necessarily explicitly sexual in the same way. Likewise, there are some individuals who are in a Monogam a sexually monogamous relationship, and yet they've negotiated that they do scenes with other people. Mm -hmm. And so again, that I think allows for erotic interactions with people outside of the relationship, but in a way that is negotiated and doesn't threaten the monogamous sexual relationship that the individuals have. Yeah, that reminds me of um, that television show, Billions. Um, and the character Chuck uh, in that, him and his wife, and he, um, like takes part in BDSM scenes, but she doesn't necessarily, but it's kind of part of making their relationship work. Um, well, you've said a few things there and it actually leads uh, on really well to my next question was, does it always involve sex? So how much of BDSM involves it or not? There hasn't been research yet that has looked at what proportion of the time that people are doing BDSM does it also involve sex or how often mm -hmm. sex then turns into BDSM? But it really varies and it varies based on the person, uh, the people, the relationship, and so on. For some people, BDSM is highly sexual and BDSM can be foreplay to penetrative sex of, of one sort or another. For other people, BDSM can be very different. BDSM can be very erotic, but not necessarily explicitly sexual. Uh, for other people, BDSM can be primarily a spiritual experience, or BDSM can be a path to getting into an altered state of consciousness, in which case it may be completely non-sexual. There are also asexually identified individuals who also do BDSM. So I think, again, an illustration of the idea that BDSM can be sexual, but is not always sexual for people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What kind of, I'm just, just trying to think now, things that are portrayed in TV shows and on film. Actually, I'm going to ask you this. How accurate are, they, are those things ever? Do they consult with people when they are making these scenes or are people just making this stuff up off the top of their head? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, it can vary quite a bit. Uh, yeah. I think that there are some well-informed portrayals of it. I think, unfortunately, the most popular portrayal out there, Fifty Shades of Grey and its sequels, uh, does not paint a particularly accurate or positive portrayal of BDSM. Um, mm -hmm. I have read the first book, I have seen the mm -hmm. movie, and my hope is that Fifty Shades of Grey in the larger sense, is getting a conversation going in our society that I think is a really useful conversation to have. Uh, and my hope is that most readers of Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, most people who watch the movies, get out of it the idea that, oh, this power exchange, this kink can be exciting and fun, but not take from that a kind of how-to of how to do that because mm -hmm. the relationship portrayed in the book has um, some disturbing stalker aspects of it. Uh, there yeah. are some real questionable uh, uh, 
questions that can be asked about whether what's going on is really fully consensual, mm -hmm. uh, is the bottom in those scenes really wanting to be there and consenting to be there and so on. And so I think that there's a lot that's being portrayed that is not representative of healthy BDSM. But mm -hmm. if Fifty Shades of Grey get, gets people curious, and they then go out uh, onto the internet and get a lot of the better accurate information about how to do these activities, what these activities uh, uh, are, then I think it hopefully can be doing some good. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting what you say there about that relationship, because, you know, I think if you kind of distill it down, it's a book about a really toxic relationship, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. It's so toxic. It's like a toxic relationship romanticized, but then that's obviously a trope we see and have seen played out in romantic, in air quote, novels throughout the decades is, you know, that it's all a bit toxic and weird. And hopefully we can start to realign some of our notions of what romantic and healthy relationships should be over time yeah, and reality yeah absolutely and it, and it's not that stories about toxic relationships yeah. can't be mm. very mm. interesting to read uh and that we can't learn a lot from i just hope that people reading 50 shades of gray are not using it as a way to learn how to properly do bdsm there's a lot of better information out there and frankly a lot of better uh, bdsm erotica if, if people are looking for uh something hot and you know and, and fun to read but that is the one that seems to be the most popular yeah. right now <laughs> I know. Do you know, I haven't actually, um, I haven't read the books and I skipped through bits of the film. And I remember when, um, when I worked somewhere, one of my friend's mums was reading the book and he literally brought the book into work. And he was just, for no reason, he just kept every now and again, just picking times to just start doing a reading out loud. <laughs> he just put, <laughs> arbitrarily pick pages and stand up and just read it to the audience. <laughs> It was because he was just so shocked at how bad the writing was. He was like, it's nothing to do with the content. He was like, what even is this sentence structure? <laughs> so now I'm just picturing him and my assignment in my head, standing up and reading bits of it. But um... that, that might be its its most proper way to be conveyed. So, yeah, Fifty yeah. Shades of Grey, read aloud, randomly at the workplace, sure. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, everyone is fine in that workplace. It right, you right know, yes, you got to have the right workplace. That you know, not not any workplace would be open to that. But <laughs> exactly, let's be clear. Yeah, consensuality, um, consent is exactly. Important, so. Oh yes, definitely. Um, but why are people? I know we touched on it a bit before, but why are people drawn to BDSM, and why do people like it? Like, is there? I mean, it's, it's sorry, it's such a, it's such a kind of a broad question, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a great question and with apologies I, I wish I had a better answer for you because at the moment uh, the answer is we really don't know there are a lot of theories about there uh, out there about why people like BDSM what they find exciting about it uh, what they get out of BDSM uh, for example uh, Roy Baumeister a social psychologist has a really interesting theory of masochism as escape from self uh, and the idea of this theory is that people pursue masochism they bought in, in BDSM scenes as a way of temporarily relieving the burden of selfhood, the, you know, the part of me that is uh, a professor and has to prep for class and worry about what my students are going to think, the part of me that is, you know, a husband, the part of, like, all of the stresses of life um, can get pretty weighty. And according to this theory of masochism as escape from self, one of the benefits of masochism is a way of temporarily cutting all of that off, that while somebody is in the middle of a scene, the intensity of the physical activities, the intensity of the psychological activities kind of gets somebody completely into the here and now, and that can be a big relief. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one theory about it. And my suspicion is that, like a lot of things, that explains some masochism for some masochists some of the time. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's a universal explanation, but my suspicion is that it, there's probably some accuracy to it. Mm -hmm. uh, for other people, they are, for reasons that we don't fully understand. Um, their sexuality appears to be kind of wired in a way that bondage or other BDSM type activities lead to sexual arousal and excitement. Some people talk about a childhood experience that they remember, uh, not necessarily an abusive one, but something that some people talk about, for example, as a child uh, experiencing something medically that they had leg braces or something, and they end up associating a later interest in bondage with those braces that they remember being in as a child or they came upon some 
physical object at a pivotal moment that ended up touching them in a way that they later found themselves very into latex or or something like that. So there are a lot of theories out there. And one of the things I'm really excited about over the coming years uh, is as more research is done and we start to get a better idea of why people are into BDSM or any other ki kind of particular sexuality or, or experience. So I guess there's a very long-winded, uh, we don't really know, but there are a lot of interesting ideas and check back with me in 20, 50 <laughs> years and, and maybe I'll have a better answer for you at that point. Amazing. Um, so the main thing I think that when people think of BDSM, they don't think about, um, well, again, I've, I, every, I've spoken to pretty much everyone. I've said, oh, this is what I'm doing because I kind of wanted to get their questions and kind of wanted to see what their reactions would be as well. And the first thing that everyone thought of was pain. They didn't think about the um, the dom sub kind of relationship or anything like that. They just went straight to pain. And they were like, oh, I don't know that I want anyone to hurt me. I don't want to hurt anyone. Oh, no, I don't understand that. But then as, as that is a part of it, how can some people experience physical or emotional pain as pleasurable? What what how is that happening? Well, it's definitely important to note that masochists don't enjoy every kind of pain. Uh, okay. You know, the, the kind of typical example is masochists don't enjoy stubbing their toes. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of uncontrolled uh, pain that is outside of the context of BDSM is typically going to be unpleasant for everybody, including people who are pretty intense masochists. So it is pain, but administered in a particular context, in a particular way. Sexual arousal, for example, has been shown to increase pain tolerance. And so something that might normally be unpleasant pain in the context of sexual arousal might be seen as pleasant pain. You think about people who enjoy getting bitten, enjoy getting hickeys, enjoy other things like that. I think that there are a lot of activities that people might be able to connect to and understand without calling them BDSM. So, you know, do you enjoy biting your partner during sex? Do you enjoy getting bitten during sex? Do you enjoy getting your back scratched during sex? Things like that. Uh, I think there are a fair number of people the research would suggest that would say yes, and that might be a way of connecting and say, okay, well, that's a way that many people enjoy some amount of pain during a sexual interaction. And BDSM just sort of takes that uh, to an nth degree. Um, but it's done in the context of trust. It's done in the context of consent. Uh, and it's done hopefully with a skilled top who's able to read the bottom during a scene, the top being the person who's, you know, swinging the whip, um, administering the, the physical, psychological sensations, the bottom person, the person who's receiving them. And a top who is doing a good job of reading their bottom will be able to choreograph the activity in a way that the bottom is going to be finding gratifying uh, and enjoyable. Interesting. So before um, we went into this question, you said, come back to me in 20 to 50 years when you've done <laughs> the research. So this brings us neatly to talking about your job. So what does the science of BDSM team do? And how did you get started in this area? I need the full story. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the Science of BDSM Research Team is a group of researchers that are dedicated to the scientific study of BDSM, body rituals, and related practices. Uh, power exchange, authority transfer relationships, and so on. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary group. I'm a social psychologist, and the majority of the team uh, is from the field of psychology, but we have worked with sociologists, sexologists, uh, neuroscience uh, folks. And so we try to approach the question of BDSM from a variety of different perspectives, trying to get an understanding of what are the effects of these activities, uh, for example, in terms of the couple bonding that we've observed, the decreases in psychological stress uh, that people uh, experience in BDSM scenes, the altered states of consciousness that they get into, as well as trying to understand the dynamics of BDSM relationships. And we've also started to look into some body rituals, people who do things like fire walking, sweat lodges, uh, piercing type rituals, and so on. And what we've seen often is that there are real parallels between the effects of these body rituals that may often be thought of as not BDSM and what mm -hmm. we see in more traditionally thought about BDSM. So in some ways, these may be a variety of activities that are all leading to the same desirable psychological state. Mm -hmm. 
I started studying BDSM some years ago uh, when I was in graduate school at Arizona State University. I met uh, Bert and Nadine Cutler uh, and started to discuss with them. Uh, they are two of the founders of the Arizona Power Exchange and uh, uh, Bert Cutler started to suggest to me that I aim some of my research uh, toward looking at uh, BDSM, and eventually I did, and now uh, probably half to more than half of the research that I do is in the area of BDSM, and it's just a wonderful, uh, fun area of research. It's one that there is a tremendous amount of research that needs to be done because there are a number of researchers out there and research teams that are studying this, but it is such a complex fascinating area of human endeavor that we really need a lot more people studying it. And I hope that if, for example, Fifty Shades of Grey has some, some positive silver linings, one of them will be to reduce the stigma associated with the activities and the research and get more people into, into studying this so that, you know, I'll have some better answers for you in 20 years. <laughs> um, so what have been your most exciting findings and what would we find, what would the audience find most surprising? Sure. So that's a great question. When we first started to look into the physiological and psychological effects of BDSM activities, one of the really interesting things that emerged was this disconnect for BDSM practitioners between what's going on with the body and what's going on with the mind. And so we started, for example, to measure hormone levels before and after BDSM scenes. And one of the hormones we looked at was cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone that is associated with physiological stress. Uh, cortisol increases with negative experiences such as uh, dental work, but also positive experiences such as skydiving. And so cortisol increases are not always negative, but they do involve the body manifesting physiological stress, often because of somebody perceiving that they are out of control of what's going on or physical pain or other things like that uh, can happen. So when we started looking at people doing BDSM scenes, we took saliva samples before and after the scenes to look at changes in cortisol levels, and we found that for the tops in the scenes, cortisol levels stayed pretty flat um, from before to after, but then that was understandable from the perspective of the person who is in control of the activities, uh, typically not experiencing the physical sensations themselves and so on. But what we saw for the bottoms in the scenes is the cortisol level spiked from before the scene to right after the scene. At the same time, psychological stress, when we ask people how stressed are you, went in the completely opposite direction. And this disconnect between the body and the mind was what first got us thinking about these kinds of altered states of consciousness that BDSM activities can sometimes lead to. So we then started looking more directly at altered states of consciousness. We used a cognitive test called the Stroop test, uh, which is a test that's been used for 50 odd years in psychology, where somebody doing a Stroop test faces a task of reading a series of words on a, we've been using it on an iPad, uh, where they'll see a word like green, but the word green is in the color of yellow type. And what they need to do is ignore the fact that the word says green and press a button at the bottom of the screen corresponding to the color of type. That is a cognitively challenging thing to do because of course we read automatically. And so when I see the word green, I wanna press the button that says green. I don't wanna override that and press the button that says yellow. So we use the Stroop test as an indirect measure of the kinds of altered states of consciousness that bottoms sometimes report come from BDSM scenes. And what we found was that bottoms showed spikes in their Stroop scores from before the scene to after the scene, which we viewed as this indirect evidence of this altered state of consciousness that some practitioners colloquially call subspace, so this floaty, pleasurable, altered state of consciousness uh, that people sometimes get into when they, when they bottom in a BDSM scene. Wow, that is so interesting. My goodness, I've never heard of the Stroop test as well before, even though I've actually done, I think I've done that in a game on a computer, but I didn't realize that's what it's called. But isn't that fascinating? My goodness. Um, so would you say from, I know you said there's lots more research to do, would you say from your research so far that BDSM is good for people? I think that BDSM is good for many people. Mm -hmm. 
like anything, there, there are no universals. Um, and so I certainly would not want to say that BDSM is healthy for everybody. Um, I think for people who don't want to do it, they shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the relationship that you mentioned before in which one of the members of the relationship was into BDSM, uh, the partner was not, and they negotiated as part of the relationship that the person who was into BDSM could go and do scenes with other people. And that is a way that in fact in life, uh, some people negotiate that, that one, if there's a BDSM practitioner who is involved with somebody who is not at all into BDSM and, and doesn't want to go there at all, one of the ways to satisfy that is for the person who is into BDSM to periodically go and do, do scenes with other people, if that works for those particular people. Mm -hmm. um, other people find that they can explore BDSM with a partner, and the partner may find that they, in fact, have an interest in it, or they might find, as with a lot of things having to do with sexuality, that individuals individuals can give to the other what turns the other person on. And so even if one person is into BDSM and the other is not, if the person who is not feels like, yeah, that's somewhere that I can go periodically, then maybe then nego they negotiate that as part of the relationship in the way that a variety of other things in a relationship are negotiated. Um, so I do think that BDSM is for and I think the evidence would, would back this up that we have so far, is that BDSM is psychologically healthy for many people who do it. But again, I would caution before saying that it is is that for, for everybody. Awesome. Um, and how, if someone's listened to this and they've watched Fifty Shades of Grey and they're like, okay, I want to give that a try. How do people get started with it? What is the first step they should take? Well, it is definitely, as with, with a lot of other things in life, it's good to go and do some research, uh, get mm -hmm. some information. There's a lot of great information out there, a lot of uh, frequently asked questions uh, on the internet that people can go and find out about BDSM activities, how to do those things uh, safely. Um, FetLife is a social media platform uh, for uh, that a lot of BDSM practitioners are part of, and so that can be a good thing to look at. Um, there are in many cities and towns munches, which are kind of low stakes gatherings of people who are into BDSM. And so if somebody is curious and would like to meet other like-minded people to learn from and just to meet, um, they can look up uh, munches in a particular area and potentially go to that. So there's a lot of good information out there. There are also a lot of good books. Uh, Jay Weissman's SM 101 is a really good starting guide that gives a lot of good information about the way to negotiate scenes, how to do the activities safely and so on. And then I think, you know, have fun. Um, don't take it too seriously. And, and start off slowly and carefully. At the same time, BDSM activities, particularly some of them, have the, the potential for being dangerous. And so it definitely pays to get some education, especially if people are going to do more intense things. A rope bondage, for example, can be done safely, but to do it safely, uh, people need to know what they're doing because rope tied the wrong way can cut off circulation to extremities. Uh, obviously, rope around the neck can be exceedingly dangerous and, and lead to death, and so that is definitely not uh, recommended and so on. And so getting information before somebody starts and then starting slowly and, and seeing what uh, turns the part, par both partners on. A lot of communication is really critical. And I think to go back to one of the topics that we talked about earlier, one of the things that BDSM practitioners have done and really pioneered in a lot of ways is this idea of affirmative consent, the idea that people who are going to do BDSM sit down and talk with each other before they do a scene about what do they want, what are their limits, what are their turn-ons, and so on. And one of the, I think, wonderful things that has come out of, of that example is that that kind of discussion in no way undermines the excitement of the scene. One of the criticisms of affirmative consent kind of in the larger community and on college campuses, for example, is that, well, you know, if we sit down and talk about sex, then that's gonna jinx it. We're never gonna be able to have sex. Or if we have sex, it's gonna be awkward and clinical. And I think if you look at what the BDSM community has done, um, that shows that that is just absolutely not the case. BDSM practitioners can sit down and have very explicit discussions about what they wanna do and what that then does is it gives them the freedom to jump into a scene and know what each of them want and don't want, know what the limits are, uh, and then they can have, have a lot of fun uh, doing it. Brilliant. That's an awesome answer. Um, so before we go, are there any other myths you'd like to bust around um, like BDSM or is there anything else that you think that people should know? Well, 
BDSM is not rare. Mm -hmm. If you ask people not about, do you do BDSM? Are you a BDSM practitioner? Because those people, some people will say yes, but the numbers tend to be relatively lower. If you ask people about activities, if you ask people about fantasies, uh, the numbers are well above 50%, and the most recent numbers I've seen are, are upwards of two thirds. So if somebody is finding that they are interested in BDSM or that a partner approaches them and it, the partner is interested in BDSM, They've got a lot of good company. Arguably, the majority of people out there have some interest in uh, either fantasizing about BDSM, trying it out in some way. And so a desire for BDSM is statistically very common. Uh, and the evidence would suggest that people who do BDSM are uh, not terribly different psychologically than, than everybody else is. And so it, a desire for BDSM does not mean that somebody is psychologically unhealthy or in need of treatment or care or something like that. So I think that those are some important things to, to know about, um, especially because there are a lot of people out there who are interested in it or who having, you know, read Fifty Shades of Grey or hopefully one of the better pieces of BDSM erotica that's out there find that, that this stuff seems pretty exciting and they're in good company. Yeah, and I think, yeah, people are definitely becoming more open about it, especially like in the past few years on dating apps, I've seen more and more people actually saying like what they're into and it's like they're looking for long-term partners it's not like it's kind of a it's not like a casual dating app it's just people just being really really open and that can only be a good thing where people are just really clear about what they want and i think that sort of communication is critical there has been research that has looked at BDSM practitioners and discussing past relationships with partners who were not into BDSM uh, and in, in current relationships or desire for relationships with partners who are into BDSM. And that kind of open, transparent communication is critical in terms of finding a compatible partner and mm -hmm. setting up an open relationship. Um, and while it certainly can be the case that if somebody communicates to a potential partner that they're into BDSM, the partner may say, you know what, I'm not into that, but mm -hmm. that probably means that they're not compatible. And so mm -hmm. while that is sad because, you know, it's a potential relationship that may not be pursued, at the same time, that gives both people the potential to then go and find a more compatible partner. Now, having said that, one critical piece of information that I want to talk about from actually our, our most recently published study uh, is that long-term successful BDSM relationships do not require the partners to be a perfect jigsaw puzzle fit in terms of their kinks. So mm -hmm. what one person is into, the other person does not in lockstep need to be into exactly the same thing. What's critical is that what one person is into, the other person needs to be willing to go there. Um, and so if one person is really into something and the other person is like, oh my God, I cannot imagine doing that, those people are probably not gonna be compatible. But if one person is like, yeah, I really like this, and the other person is like, oh, yeah, I can take it or leave it, but yeah, we could try that. That's a relationship that has the potential for success because over the course of the relationship, each person engages in what uh, is sometimes referred to as erotic gift giving. So each person gives to the other what turns them on and then mm -hmm. gets some vicarious excitement by turning their partner on because you know, as, as many of us is, have experienced, um, turning a partner on can certainly be something that ends up being very exciting and pleasurable uh, for ourselves. Um, so finding a partner really uh, open communication can help a lot. I'm very glad to hear that that's something that people are being more open about on dating sites because I think that that can be very helpful in terms of finding a compatible partner and people avoiding potential partners who would not be compatible. Sexual compatibility is very important uh, in terms of the success of a relationship. Definitely. Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, where would you like to be found online? And is there anything that you'd like to plug? Sure. Uh, anybody who's interested in some more information, uh, mostly about the academic side of BDSM, uh, should, would find us at www.scienceofbdsm.com. You can go there and download copies of the research articles that we've published, get links to media stories about us. We also have a lengthy BS, uh, BDSM bibliography that lists many papers that BDSM researchers and also BDSM community authors have put together uh, in books that that can give a lot of great information about BDSM. So uh, anybody who would like sort of a, a, a first jump into that side of things uh, would find us at uh, scienceofbdsm.com.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, and have a lovely day. I've learned so much today. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, this has been great. Thank you so much for bringing me on. Thank you for listening to speak on make sure you like subscribe and share with your friends family co-workers strangers in the street to find out more about us including our upcoming events head over to instagram instagram.com forward slash speak on underscore bye